morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are. And welcome to the workshop on the branch of Next Spaces. It's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dan T. Martin from Simon Stoyloff Institute of Mathematics of the Romanian Academy of Sciences. And he will continue his mini course on the branches of Next Spaces. Thanks a lot. So as I was saying, I'm uh, <clears throat> a little bit uh, uneasy because uh, some of my punchlines of today have already been uh, shown to you yesterday and even more than this. But well, that's life. I have to continue. <clears throat> and uh, the first thing is uh, the basic dichotomy that uh, uh, the brown spaces present that already has appeared, I think, in more than one talk yesterday. Uh, so, <clears throat> as I say, uh, you have you split in two the theory because uh, it's quite surprising, surprising how different things happen according to whether B is not an extreme point of the unit ball of H infinity. Now, extreme point, uh, this is a geometric characterization but in fact what we are interested in uh, is that it has a, an analytic characterization you must have this uh, inequality satisfied and uh, the equivalence of these two things you sometimes it's attributed to the Lou and Rudin but in fact it appears only in a, a note, in a note at the end of uh, uh, the paper that uh, deals with extreme, with the unit ball of H1. And then at the end, they just say, well, it's uh, just to complete things. This is a well-known fact that uh, in H infinity is extremely if and only if this happens. <clears throat> okay, so in particular, uh, inner functions that we have, uh, net already at model spaces are extreme because in fact you have just a zero everywhere here uh, you see that being uh, non-extreme means that uh, this quantity here uh, is not very often zero the <coughs> the for instance if uh, you just take a b strictly smaller h infinity strictly smaller uh, norm streak is more than one, of course, it's not extreme. Now, uh, something that already Alexandra Aleman stated yesterday, uh, that uh, in a very rough way, you can uh, describe the behavior of H of B in these two cases, like in the first case, non-extreme, it resembles somehow H2, while in the, the extreme case, it resembles the model space of KU. And from this point of view, in fact, uh, we will see that uh, somehow we will have more to say about the non-extreme case, because the extreme case, well, it's, you try to, you find out that you get more or less what happens in KU, well, you can extend it often and, you have to work a little bit more to change a little bit some things, but it's not very different. While in the first case, I said it has common feature with H2, but also it's very different. So probably we will see during the course that we will have to say more things about uh, the, the non-extreme case. Okay, let's uh, just to, to, to check what happens when B is rational. Uh, then it uh, has an inner outer factorization where both uh, terms are rational and BI is a Blaschke product. And to get the other factor, well, you can, no, not to get, you can get the other factor, of course, by looking at the zeros and arranging. Um, uh, taking them outside the unit uh, disk. But now I was uh, just, wa I wanted to make this uh, remark, which is um, somehow a simple case of a more complicated description that will appear on the next page. Namely that uh, 
because of the theory theorem, you can find a trigonometric polynomial R with this property. So in fact, you can immediately construct a rational function A with the properties that one minus B of uh, E to the IT squared is equal to modulus of A to uh, E to the IT squared. So our integral that we were interested in here, um, sometimes I can put uh, one minus b to the eit squared or without the square because uh, there is another factor that is surely finite. So it doesn't change the basic condition, which is that uh, the integral has to be uh, larger than minus infinity. So this integral actually is precisely the, uh, yeah, so of course there's a factor here. Oh. I divide it by two and I multiply by two, so there's no more two in the one over pi. <clears throat> so in case, we have two cases, either B is inner, then A is identically zero, or if this does not happen, then A is not identically zero and being a rational function, an outer rational function, this log logarithm is surely greater than minus infinity. Singularities of the A can be some multiple zeros on the boundary on T. And then if you take the log, then it's integrable. You don't have a problem. So in fact, in this case, you can, in the rational case, you can uh, see that uh, B is extreme precisely when it's inner. There are no other ways for B to be extreme. And, but of course, this is not true in general. There exists extreme non-inner function. You can just, you, you may uh, fix the modulus on the boundary as you want, and you can make it to be one on part of the boundary and not one on the rest. So this part gives you the integral of minus infinity and the rest doesn't count. Okay, so <clears throat> we start maybe for the reason that I said that they are a little bit more interesting. We start with a non-extreme case and we will try to see some of, our, of the properties in this case. Now, the first thing we do in the non-extreme case is actually to repeat the trick that uh, we had on the previous page, namely the, the trick with the, I just, one moment. Okay, so this construction of A, that was done here somehow by hand by use of the fair risk polynomial uh, theorem. Uh, actually, you can do it in, a, in the general case for B non-extreme because once you know that this function here is integrable, you can uh, construct the classical formula to construct the outer function that has this modulus. So this function is uniquely determined by these two properties. First, it's outer and uh, the sum a squared plus b squared modulus on uh, t is equal to one. Such a pair will be called a Euclidean pair. And the first thing that we want to note is that uh, from this relation, we can immediately obtain this relation between the Toeplitz operators. And since we know that the, <coughs> Toeplitz, the ranges of the Toeplitz, these Toeplitz operators are respectively the two spaces that appear here, we have mth a bar equal h of b bar. So this is uh, an equality that is much used in the in the theory of non-extreme, in the non-extreme case for the Brown spaces. <clears throat> so we come back to this example because uh, uh, I discussed the space corresponding to this example quite at length yesterday, and it will come back again and again. It's it's a kind of the simplest non-trivial example of the Brown-Jerovniak space. And when I say non-trivial, this means that it's uh, uh, not something very trivial and neither is it a uh, model space because we already had a whole course on model spaces. 
So in the case of B, we find A, it's equal one minus Z over two. <clears throat> now, if you remember, I haven't written here, but uh, uh, when we um, computed, when we get a formula for H of B in this case, uh, we had one minus Z that played in main role there. And this is, uh, as you can expect, it's not by chance, but we are not yet there. This will come later. Okay, I mentioned also this fact that B rational implies A rational, which was on the previous slide. And now a first result. Let me put all the statements here. Uh, this is somehow, somehow a technical result that uh, is uh, quite important when you start to work with uh, the case non-extreme. Namely, <clears throat> for each f in h of b, you can find some element with, which traditionally is denoted f plus in h2 with this properties, t b bar of f is equal to t a bar f plus. Now, the importance of this element is in the point two, uh, where you see that the scalar product in H of B and the norm in H of B, of course, can be written in just in terms of the usual scalar product and the usual norm, if <clears throat> you apply it to the same function. Now, of course, this doesn't... Um, simplify completely the computation of the norm because you have to find f plus. But still, in many cases, you may find f plus and then you have uh, just the usual scalar product. As you remember that one of the problems that we have in the Brown spaces, like in uh, reproducing kernel spaces, is that we don't have a, an explicit formula for the scalar product or for the norm. And in fact, this, is, uh, this uh, has a kind of converse, namely if we are given F in H2 and we find F plus such that one is true, then automatically we know that F in, is in H of B. So what we will do um, soon uh, will be <clears throat> to exhibit some elements of H of B by finding F plus. Okay, so let's prove this, or at least let's give a sketch of proof because it's very simple. Well, part of it, I think three, I don't uh, prove three. Uh, we had a general theorem that said uh, yesterday, that said that a uh, function f belongs to the, the Brown-Jerovniak space, if and only h of b, if and only if tb bar applied to f is in h of b bar, but on the previous slides, we had just noted that h of b bar is equal to m of a bar. So, of course, if it's m of a bar, it has to be of the form t a bar applied to some vector f plus. And this is also uniquely defined because a outer means that t a has dense range, which passing to the adjoint means that t a bar is injected. So f plus is unique. And we have basically proved one and two. Now, before we go further, let's do this. Um, the, let's remark this thing. Uh, as I said, it's quite important to know which is F plus. We, we don't have a formula that uh, tells us how we uh, find F plus except this relationship. So it's good to note that uh, if we take an F, that has that is in H B, and that has an F plus. Then we remember that T phi bar F is also in H of B. This was a general fact uh, for the Brown-Jerovniak spaces that they are invariant to uh, adjoints of uh, analytic its operators. But not only is it uh, there. But uh, these formulas shows us that the plus corresponding to T phi bar F is obtained by applying T phi bar F to F plus. So we, this makes some computation easier, you will see. Okay, now 
the first thing as I advertised that I can obtain is that I can exhibit some elements that are in H of B. For instance, one, the constant function one is in H of B. This is quite nice because you remember that it's not always in model spaces, only when B of zero is zero. But here it's always no matter which is B. And how do we do it? Well, I, as I said, I, we just write this, just write this relation one by writing directly F plus. So our F plus is B of zero bar divided by A of zero bar. Remember that A is outer, so there's no problem in division by A of zero. <clears throat> So since this is immediately not checked, it follows that one is in H of B and that we can also compute its norm, which is written there. Okay, B itself, this is quite another thing, interesting thing, uh, that B is in H of B. Uh, this is more surprising if you think of, uh, well, it's not surprising because of spaces are different, but in uh, model spaces, uh, B is never in H of B. It's always outside because remember that uh, uh, the, the orthogonal of the model space is uh, BH2. Uh, well, and this is also um, <clears throat> computation. I just, it's written here and you find, we find that B plus is uh, this uh, guy one over A of zero bar minus A. And again, this allows us to compute also the norm. Okay, something else. Remember that one is the Cauchy kernel corresponding to zero. Well, we have all Cauchy kernels corresponding to um, points in the unit disk belong to H of B. And this again, you have here the relations that uh, ensure this. And the main thing is that uh, you remember that the relation that we are interested in implies TB bar and TA bar, and KW is an eigenvector for both of them. This is the general um, reproducing kernel space fact, so it's easy to obtain this relation. And as in the first case, we divide by A of W, which is different from zero. And uh, well, I haven't. <clears throat> Written here the computation, but you can obtain also that here you have one B, here you will have KW and BKW, which is also in H of B. Okay, something else about H of B. No model space KU contains a set of all polynomials. However, for B non extreme, the opposite happens. B in, <clears throat> P is contained in H of B, and not only is it contained, but it's dense therein. And I give a proof, which is not very complicated. So I know that uh, A of zero is different from zero. So T A bar applied to the polynomial starts with you see if you apply ta bar then somehow you have the you go to the left with the problem with a and so uh, the result is that you start with a of zero bar cn cn plus terms of lower degree and so ta bar maps a polynomial into a polynomial of the same degree now i know that this means that uh so I, if I start with the polynomial of degree n, I apply T of a bar, I obtain also a polynomial of degree n of the same degree. This means that n of a bar contains polynomials of all degrees. And if it contains polynomials of all degrees, it's easy to see that in fact, it has to contain all polynomials. So even m of a bar contains all polynomials, which is equal to h of b bar. And there was a, fact uh, stated at the beginning that h of b bar includes h of b uh, includes h of b bar so the polynomials are in h of b well in this moment uh, we uh, might be surprised by the fact that uh, polynomials are dense in h of b because 
h of b bar is in principle smaller it's contractively included but <clears throat> this i will do immediately first of all note that since polynomials are dense in h2 they are dense also in m of a bar this is just the computation of the norm you see the the norm of t a bar applied to p minus f in m of a bar is just the norm of p minus f in the hardy space and then this means that uh, on the other hand ta bar p is also a polynomial we just saw so if we get epsilon smaller than epsilon in the first term the same happens for the second term and, <clears throat> and then i have a claim that I claim that M of A is a dense submanifold in H of B, which would finish the matter. And this is a little bit of computation that you have to do. It's not so immediate like the previous points in this proof. Namely, we start with an H of B that, uh, well, with an H in H of B that we suppose orthogonal to M of A bar. And we want to show that it's zero. So if it's orthogonal on a, M of A bar, it's orthogonal to all these guys here. And now using this nice formula that I noticed on, uh, um, on the, when I introduced the, the F plus and the formula for the scalar product, the scalar product in B is equal, can be written in uh, with the usual scalar product if I use the, the pluses, then I obtain this relation. Well, this is quite, uh, okay. So here, of course, it's product. It's not A of this. Okay. <clears throat> now this means that uh, you, you see, this is true for any, uh, for all N greater than zero. So the, this means that the usual scalar product of this function with the monomials with exponentials with a, a non positive degree is zero. So this belongs to the, the what is under the integral belongs to H2 naught. And now we apply a property about our function. If we have a function G in L2, this is usually stated for H2, but it's the same thing for H2 naught. If we have a function in <clears throat> L2 and its product with a, an outer function is in H2, then the function itself is in H2, or in this case, in H2 naught. Somehow we can divide by uh, outer function, so to speak. Uh, so I uh, just saw that I have a question. Of course, the uh, polynomials are dense in the H of B norm. Yes, this is correct. Here they are uh, in the first line here, they are dense in M of A bar, so in its norm. And then the, um, the original statement was that they are uh, dense in the H of B norm. Okay, so we have obtained a positive function in H2 naught, which has to be zero and the claim is proved. And putting all pieces together, it follows that P is dense in H of D. So our de Brange-Rovniak space has, has the polynomials inside and has a dense set. Okay, now, I get close to, well, I I'm, will have a superposition with um, Alexandra, uh, no, with Parise's talk of yesterday. Uh, if I have a function in H of B, there exists a sequence such that Pn of a minus F tends to zero, but of course this existence result, we should like to know how we can make this approximation and more, Precisely, there are usual standard ways of uh, approximating analytic functions by polynomials. We can take the partial sums, we can take the 
Cesaro means, we can take the dilations and tend R to one. Well, there is an example that, uh, as I said, was uh, quoted by Parise yesterday. I was going to say yesterday night, which was the situation in here, but for you, it was yesterday afternoon. Uh, namely that uh, you may have an example where, where none of these ways of uh, is good for convergence because all of all the approximate approximants in the different uh, <clears throat> types of approximate all tend to infinity and in fact this as a as it's written here is a, a an example of 2016 but uh, last in the talk of yesterday we learned that in fact this example is worse than you can expect that uh, it's not con it's not good you don't have convergence even with a, a large class of a summation method that you might have expected to work better and just, of course, I will not prove this here, but just one remark that uh, the reason why this does not work is that precisely this map F goes to F plus is bad for this function. <clears throat> F may have small norm and F plus explodes. Okay. So these are the main things about uh, the non-extreme case and uh, then I will speak a little bit about the extreme case. I, I won't speak very much about the extreme case because uh, as I said many things happen like in the inner case so they are not very spectacular but uh, still let's discuss a little bit uh, analytic continuation. Analytic continuation of uh, elements of HFB because in the non-extreme case, there are maybe many elements that uh, can extend analytically in a neighborhood of the disk. Remember that in case norm of V is strictly smaller than one, H of V is equal to H of two as a set. So it contains all kinds of uh, function that can be extended. Well, in the extreme case, it's uh, things are much more restrictive, namely the following are equivalent. F is an H of B and can be analytically continued in a neighborhood of the unit of the closed unit disk if and only if F is rational and TB bar F is equal to zero. And in this case, for these functions, the norm in H of B is precisely equal to the H2 norm. So for this type of function, you have equality. And I will prove the simple part, which is two implies one. I will show that if two happens, then the function can be analytically continued. And the reason is that if TB bar F is equal to zero, then it's in particular, of course, it's in H of B bar. So the result of yesterday implies that F is in H of B. So this is uh, the first thing. And, uh, oh, yes. Okay. And the rational function cannot have poles on T and so it can be analytically continued. So if it's rational, it can be analytically continued across all of T. So we have both uh, statements in one are true. And the norm, well, the norm is simple because we can compute it by taking the norm of TB bar F in H of B bar, but TB bar F is zero. So the second term uh, is zero. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, in particular in case, I will just comment a little bit what uh, this means in uh, if the case uh, in, in the inner case, because then TB bar F is equivalent to F in, belongs to uh, KU. 
So you just have this condition with the rationality. There is no condition about TB bar F anymore. And uh, if you, so if, uh, if it's inner, it may be a Blaschke product, then all elements are rational. And so all extend analytically in a neighborhood. Or if it's not rational, if it's not a Blaschke product, then there always are non-rational elements in KU. For instance, KUV, if U, W different from zero, and those do not extend analytically. So if U is not rational, I always have non-rational, I always have elements in KU that do not extend analytically. <coughs> okay, now this is an interesting corollary again for extreme functions. Remember that for non-extreme functions, all Cauchy kernels belong to the space. Well, in the extreme case, only in the case B of lambda is equal to zero. And this is one thing. And the second thing is that if a monomial belongs to H of B, then B has to have a zero of order at least M plus one at the origin. Again, remember that in, in the non-extreme case, all <coughs> polynomials belong to H of B. And as I say, it's a simple corollary because if B of lambda is equal to zero, then K, well, the Cauchy kernel is equal to the, the Brown-Jorgniak kernel. So it has to be there. And inversely, K lambda <coughs> itself extends outside D. So, in order for it to belong to H of B, we must have TB bar K lambda equal to zero, but we know that K lambdas are eigenvectors with eigenvalue B of lambda bar. So from here it follows that B of lambda is zero. <coughs> Sorry, I have to drink a bit of water. Okay, for point number two, I just write B of Z as a series. Then I obtain this formula. And you see that uh, the TB bar ZM is zero, which is the condition for Z to the M to belong to H of B, if and only if all these coefficients are zero up to M. And you can check then that all polynomials in uh, of degree smaller or equal than M are in H of B. Okay, now um, I have to go fast over this slide because this is what uh, appeared in Alexander's talk of yesterday, but still I thought that it's uh, a result so nice you may repeat it next day, it's not bad. Uh, so in the non-extreme case, polynomials are dense. Here, from the corollary, it shows that you cannot have dense, uh, a dense set of polynomials except when H of B is finite dimensional, which happens very rarely. And so I would like to have other dense sets composed of nice functions. And you might think of continuous function because you have Alexandrov's theorem that says that in the model spaces, the continuous functions that are in KU are dense therein. Well, and th this is quite an uh, interesting proof because it's not constructive. And I just give you an example. If you have a singularity on the boundary, like the simple singular inner function, there's, you don't have a concrete example of continuous function in KU. And uh, uh, recently we had this extension of Aleman and Malman that said that the same thing happens for B extreme. So they managed to also to obtain by a duality argument, uh, the, uh, the equivalent of Alexandro's theorem. And in fact, uh, yesterday, uh, Aleman talked of other generalization and I, I understood that today we will hear about other generalizations from Bartosz Malman. Okay, <clears throat> now here I make the connection with what I did in the first, at the beginning. I said that uh, the, the interest of the Branja Merovniak when they 
introduce the, 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 their spaces was to obtain model spaces, to obtain functional models. So let's see what happens with H of B as a functional model. Uh, for this, I start with the model spaces, the KUs. Uh, remember that uh, U is uh, inner, I have the KU, I have the compression of S to KU, or the compression of the separately separated corresponding to Z. And KU is invariant with respect to the adjoint. And these are the model spaces. And of course, once you call them model spaces, the question is, what are they models for? And this has appeared in um, Stefan's course. There is a theorem. Now, I prefer to state it for the adjoint because for the uh, Brown spaces, it's more natural to write them for the adjoint. Namely, they are models of the following class, the contractions that have defect operators of rank one and tend strongly to zero. So such an operator is unitarily equivalent to the restriction of uh, S star to a model space for some inner function U. Well, now remember that our space H of B to the Brunner-Rognac space also is invariant with respect to S star. So I can take the restriction, which I have already denoted by XB. And the question is whether XB is a model operator. In other words, is there a class of operators such that whenever the, such that every operator from that class is unitary equivalent to some XP? Uh, well, the answer is partially yes. First of all, I have this theorem that is very uh, similar to the previous theorem. Namely, to have T unitary equivalent to XB for some extreme function B in the unit ball, uh, it's necessarily sufficient to have again the defects of rank one, but then instead of t to the n tends to zero, you ask less. Well, it doesn't have to tend necessarily to zero, but in any case, there must be no subspace, no invariant subspace such that its restriction there is an isometry. So we have h of b's for extreme functions are functional models for this class of space of, of contractions. But if we, now you see both, in both cases, we have this condition on the defects, i minus t star t and i minus t t star rank one. Well, we are still left with one case. What happens if there exists a subspace of H invariant to t and such that its restriction is an isometry? Uh, somehow, if things were nice, it should have been equivalent to XB for some non-extreme B. But the answer is, well, unfortunately, let's say no. Uh, in this case, if you want to obtain a model space, a functional model, then it's more complicated. We need, you need a second space. And the model space, you can write it is a space of pairs and functions. And with this very complicated definition, I will not discuss, but um, it's, uh, well, it, it's very non-constructive. And maybe this is one of the reasons that uh, the nock uh, theory was more successful because it captured this case in a easier visualizable way. Okay, so uh, one thing before we go further, we still can be stubborn and say, well, I'm thinking of H of B for non-extreme. Is it not a functional model for a certain class of operators? Well, it happens uh, that um, it is, but uh, it's not a very nice class. Uh, first of all, there are two simple conditions these, the defect condition, but you see that this defect has rank two. 
So we cannot expect it to be a model for the for the contractions with defects of rank one. And the dimension of the kernel one, t to the n tends to zero strongly. And then there are some other two conditions which are really complicated to state that appear in a paper by Javad and myself. And so we have identified this class only that it's, as I said, it's uh, quite a weird class. And what happens now? The question is if the defect ranks are higher. Well, uh, in fact, you can obtain a model theory, but uh, what you probably expect that you have to replace usual analytic function with vector valued analytic functions. Okay, now we have discussed the relation with, uh, with the function models and uh, the in the sequel, I will discuss a little bit operators on HFB. So first of all, I start with XB, which is the model operator. And we know that it's a contraction. And then you may uh, ask yourself the usual question. What is the spectrum? Well, we know, for instance, that for model spaces, the, there is the lifshitz muller theorem that says that uh, the spectrum of the adjoint. So here, all this, the adjoint appears because uh, I have considered uh, somehow the adjoint of the usual model for inner function. And uh, <clears throat> so the spectrum of the operator is related to a behavior of the function. Namely, in fact, the, the, the spectrum are the zeros in U, which are eigen like well, eigenvalues together with uh, the points, the singular the points of singularity of the function on the boundary. Well, what happens in our case for the Brown-Jorogniak spaces? Spectrum of, I will manage somehow to discuss together XB and XB star. But again, we have to split the discussion between extreme and non-extreme cases. Because in the non-extreme case, it's very simple. These spectra do not depend on B. They are just, as it's written here, the spectra are the closed unit disk. Point spectrum for XB is D, for XB star it's the empty set. And <clears throat> so uh, if you look at this, then we, uh, okay, so you see that the x, the eigenvectors of uh, xb are exactly the eigenvectors of s star because all the kw's that are eigenvectors for s star in h2, in fact, belong to h of b. And so from here, you immediately obtain that uh, the spectrum of uh, the point spectrum of x b, b is the same as the point spectrum of s, s star that is D. And of course, the first <clears throat> statement follows because you have, it's a contraction. So the spectrum has to be inside the closed unit disk. And from here you have the closed unit disk there. And three is also true, I don't prove it now. So this happens in the non-extreme case. In the extreme case, things become very similar to the inner case. It's uh, okay, so I just write, again, I have the spectrum of B, which is, I write it directly, the union of the zeros of B in D and the complements of the arcs on I in D through which B may be extended analytically and the modulus of B is one. This is necessary. It's automatically satisfied for inner function, so it did not appear there this condition on the modulus of B on the circle. But for non-inner functions means that whenever you have an arc where this is smaller than one, it's bad. And then the theorem is very similar. Uh, okay, so for the moment, we just have XB star. The spectrum of XB star is this set here that is defined in terms of B. And the point spectrum is its intersection with a disk. Now what happens with XB and X, uh, the spectrum of XB and the spectrum of X, uh, the point spectrum of XB. So I thought this is the right moment to introduce a conjugation 
that is the equivalent of the conjugation on model spaces. You remember maybe that the mo on model spaces, the conjugation was defined by u z bar f bar, and it had, uh, so for, you can define it on L2, but it leaves KU invariant. And then you have here a relation that says, in fact, that X U is complex symmetric with, with respect to this conjugation. Well, in the general case, you still have a map, this one, that extends to a contractive anti-linear map from CB, uh, from HMB into itself. And in the case B is extreme, it's isometric and non two. So it becomes a conjugation on HB. So this map is the exact equivalence of the conjugation on the model space only in the extreme case. But this is the case that we were discussing. And then of course we can immediately obtain by means of this relation, the spectrum of XB and the point spectrum from those of XB star. Okay, invariant subspaces of cyclic vectors. What happens in the, uh, for S star? Because XB is a restriction of X star. Well, they are the spaces, the model spaces, KU. Well, in the non-extreme case, we know that the subspaces are exactly the ones that we have to have. And <laughs> in the sense that these spaces of the type KU intersected with H of B are invariant subspace automatically. And so it happens that in fact, these are all. In fact, this map that goes from KU to KU intersected with H of B is even one to one. The lattice of the invariant space subspaces of the of XB is isomorphic to the lattice of inner function. And cyclic vectors have uh, in S star, for S star and H2 have a precise characterization. They do not have a bounded type meromorphic pseudo continuation in the exterior of the unit disk. And I don't want to, discuss too much this definition. But in the non-extreme case, again, we have the same thing, the cyclic vectors, or the same thing, the, an analogous thing, the cyclic vectors for XB are precisely the cyclic vectors for a star that belong to H of B. Uh, now, remember that I have another operator in the case uh, in the non-extreme case, I did not discuss too much that in the non-extreme case, uh, okay, so sorry, I, um, we had from this theorem, we had just the fact that one implies four, but we have also one implies two. Then I have a formula for S that shows that two is equivalent to three. So if B belongs to H of B, so this formula tells us that the usual shift leaves H of B invariant. And then since one has this can be written as the sum of a, a kernel in H of B plus a multiple of B, once B belongs to H of B, we have one belongs to each of B and then applying S gives you all polynomials. And finally, the result that we have obtained that <clears throat> B is extreme, Z to the M implies that B has a zero of order, at least M plus one at the original shows that if the polynomials belong to H of B, we, are, well, we have to have B non-extreme. Okay, so the importance of uh, this, the consequence of this theorem, apart the fact that it's, uh, it's quite nice because it gives another characterization of non-extreme is that we may consider the operator S also uh, in, as an operator of H of B. And we will denote it by S B. Now that uh, this is, uh, you see you are uh, usually, uh, well, in many cases, S is an isometry or a contraction, but this does not happen here. 
In fact, one can compute the norm and it's strictly larger than one. However, the spectrum is just the closure of the unit disk. And why does this happen? Because I have this formula that tells you that uh, the it's a one dimensional perturbation of the contraction X B star. So any spectral points outside must be an eigenvalue, but S has no eigenvalue. So S B, which is the restriction of S doesn't have. So once we know that we have this operator, we may think of invariant subspaces of S B. And with a usual argument that we have for X B, we, mm, have the invariant subspaces H of B intersected with the invariant subspaces of S on H2. Now, what about the converse? Is every invariant subspace of this type? Well, a partial converse is true, but we need some supplementary conditions, quite weird. So we have, uh, well, we are, of course, we are working in the case B non-extreme, but we have these two conditions, the infimum of modulus of A of Z plus modulus of B of Z has to be strictly larger than one, which is usually said that A and B form a corona pair. And this condition about the operator T A over A bar, and then any subspace is of this form. Now, the second condition, uh, well, it's well known in other contexts. It happens if and only if A, uh, modulus of a squared satisfies a certain Helson Segu condition. And so this is uh, not very surprising that it appears here. And I have written here also a non trivial example because if you try uh, the usual uh, example, the usual uh, the simple rational things, usually you don't get this. But in this case, you have an example where you take, we start with A of Z and then construct B. Okay, I, uh, I'm a little bit, a bit out of time, but I will present you now just one more slide where I revisit this example, one plus Z over two. I said that it's uh, quite important and we will come back to it several times. And for it, the first condition is satisfied, but the second is not satisfied because T A over A bar is not invertible. Well, it does not satisfy the hypothesis, but it, uh, so it's not surprising that it does not satisfy the conclusion either. Remember now that in this case, H of B was the direct sum between C and Z minus one H2. Then we look at this subspace, which is a closed subspace of H of B invariant for SB, but it's not of the type that I said. Because if it would have been of uh, UH2 intersected with H of B, I have Z minus one Z in E. So this equality would imply that U is just Z because the, uh, the left-hand side here has the inner function Z. And then we will have to have U belonging to this intersection because obviously it's an H of B. But if the intersection would be E, we get a contradiction since Z is not of the form Z minus one times Z times H2. Okay, thank you. This is, I'm sorry for being a little bit over time. Thank you very much. Questions, comments, suggestions? You can ask them in chat or shout them out. Uh, Dan, is anything known about the cyclic vectors of the forward shift? Uh, cyclic vector of the forward shift for extreme. Uh, uh, for for non-extreme, because for, for non-extreme. Sorry, sorry, for non-extreme. Uh, I so I don't know exactly in this moment. Okay, maybe Manu or Javad uh, knows. Uh, there are some results in the rational case, I think. Um, mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, uh, you have 
uh, the cyclic factors, maybe they should be outer. Mm. And also, uh, they, there is a condition uh, uh, on the point on the boundary where uh, A has, it, has its zeros. Uh, so I think the, the cyclic vectors shouldn't vanish at this point or something like that. Uh, uh, and that's that's a characterization for rational. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. mm. There is a question in the chat. Are there any references on results on extreme non-extreme functions in unit ball of H infinity? I think you already mentioned them, but. Yeah, yeah, that I think, uh, well, uh, all the literature of the brown spaces, <laughs> it's uh, uh, full of this. So, well, starting with the paper for, with the book of Saracen, for instance, and then if you have finished the book of Saracen, you take the, the Frikan Ashregi book, <laughs> and you can find uh, many rush, many results there. But they, they are related to all to, well, almost invariant subspace. And then there are other things that uh, usually there are many, many such results. Thank you. More questions, comments? If not, let's thank Dan again. <laughs>